We will start off with our opponents speaking about Marx and nature and Marxism and ecology. And then what we're going to do is break into groups. We have a table over there, we've got a table there, we can also go around here. So we can discuss this amongst ourselves. And then we're going to come back, we'll discuss it together as a whole group. And then um, the speaker will reply. That's for the first thing. We'll take a break at 2.40. And then our next set, uh, section is going to be the crisis of fresh water. The, it's one of the biggest problems that's going to come back to climate change is access to clean fresh water. And so, you know, we'll have some places literally living in, in you know, almost like deserts and the rest are going to be flooded. So this is one of the most important uh, discussions on there. There's, there's already a big debate going on in many parts of the, uh, the political capitalist world as well. And we've been lucky enough to have somebody uh, from the KMK Foreign Affairs, who's going to speak? Well, that's what it says in the paper. He's going to speak on the struggle in, uh, in, uh, over in, in Kurdistan, around that area. And Roland's going to speak as well. So, um, this is Alan Thornton, who's going to speak today on uh, Marcus and Nature. Okay, I'm not going to speak. It's very good. And we can have the club, given that we're in a probably the previous period of politics that most of us have seen for a long time. It's going to appear a little many of the period of politics. And um, the so called the blood is taking place around the place. And there's also, also um, um, another Europe is possible rally taking place as well. And there's uh, a number of our comrades have gone to that and will come along here afterwards. So uh, we may have more. Um, later. Anyway, this is a very important discussion um, and we need to have it. Um, well, we, we've, entitled, we've entitled the subject um, Marxism in Nature, um, but actually um, it could be titled slightly different, um, and that is Human Beings, or Homo Sapiens, and Nature. Uh, the, two, the, two in the, sense of, the two in the sense are very similar, but nevertheless, um, that is the real question. And if we had to, um, it's very blowy. <laughs> I, think, I think if we had to pick out what is the most crucial theme in terms of the defense of the planet, the biosphere of the planet, the, the ecology of the planet, then I think that the issue of human beings and nature and the relationship between human beings and nature is the most fundamental of all. There's all the other things, climate change and everything, but that's the most crucial of all because ultimately, if we go to save the planet, rather than in place and put some you know, firefighting positions in place, we really go to save the planet. We have to get human beings as a species. Uh, have to get their relationship with nature right. And until that can be achieved, then ultimately you haven't really saved the planet. So that's, that's, really, that's really the point I'm making in the whole of it, in this thing. That's really the, the absolutely um, crucial point. Um, the, the advantage we've got as Marxists in terms of precisely that human beings and nature, is that this is one of the crucial strengths of classical Marxism, um, 19th century classical Marxism. Unfortunately, Marxism during the 20th century, almost all of it, lost that crucial insight. It lost the insight which was developed by Marx and Engels and I would say William Morris as well. And that's, this, this is the point, this is the point that I'm, it's a really, the point that I want to try to establish in all this. The, um, the work which has given us all um, important new insights into the Marxism, the, the ecology of classical Marxism, is this book, which everybody be aware of, it's been out 16 years, John Bellamy Foster, Marxist Ecology. Um, in fact, this is about 16 years, doesn't mean it's irrelevant now and it has not been surpassed. Although Melvin Foster and others have expanded on it. 
its analysis has not been surpassed um, since it was published in 2000. Um, and, and what Foster argues, and I, I'm very strongly behind, personally very strongly behind uh, uh, the position that, uh, that John Bellamy Foster argues, is that in a number of ways, well, let's put it another way. The advantage that classical Marxism had in coming to terms with um, what we could call uh, uh, materialist history of nature is that Marx, along with Darwin, was one of the two great materialists of the 19th century. And it was that materialism established by them which gave classical Marxism the basis for uh, the kind of understanding that it was able to develop. Therefore, right through classical Marxism, um, you have the conception um, of the, the, the alienation of humankind from, from nature, uh, also from work, but also, also from nature. Um, Marx developed early on um, in his work um, the, 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 the idea of a metabolic rift um, between um, human beings and nature. And when you go through um, what he's talking about with the metabolic rift, it's basically that even then, human beings were taking more from nature than they were putting in. And, and, and Marx, Marx um, identified it around the agricultural crisis of the time, uh, which was a crisis of, um, of, agri of agricultural fertility, of, 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 you know, um, um, a reduction in soil fertility. Um, this was before the, the, the advent of, 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 um, um, of, of fertilizers and so on. But there was a collapse, there was a collapse of fertility of soil. Um, and it was identified as um, a, a rupture in the, in, in the natural metabolism of the corporate human activity. Um, and it, well, this, was, this was really a crucial insight um, in, into the, the thinking. Um, Engels, Engels was equally powerful on this, I mean, not, not just with the conditions of the working class in England, which takes up um, a whole range of you know, um, pollution problems in the development of the industry and everything else, um, but also um, um, in terms of relationship with nature. This, this is Engels writing two years after Marx's death in 1980, 1984, 1985. Um, at every step, we're reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a fallen people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst. Its midst. Um, and and that all our mastery of it consists of is the fact that we have the advantage over all other creatures of being able to learn its laws and apply them correctly. In other words, he was taking from Marx the basic idea that human beings are a part of nature, have to recognise they're a part of nature, and shape their lives of existence as being a part of nature. This is this was this this, this, was, this was incredible. This was incredible. So this 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 was a contribution. This was a contribution of classical Marxism. Um, this was taken by the Bolsheviks um, immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution. In fact, much of much of, of, of this, this this thinking and these insights were taken by the Bolsheviks, who in the first years of the revolution had a very strong um, ecological um, uh, program and ecological understanding. Um, they, they set up they set up committees for the environment. They set up committees to establish national parks. Um, they started uh, taking um, um, measures to to um, um, to protect endangered species, um, and, um, and in fact they were, they were more advanced at that time than I think probably anyone else in the world. Um, this was, this was brought, brought to its end by the advent of Stalinism, and um, uh, 
Uh, most, most of those that in the 1920s were developing into ecological conceptions um, in the Soviet Union had gone to the war, even to the firing squads or disappeared into the gulags um, by, the, by the end of the 1930s. And, um, and by that time, um, Stalinism, Stalinism was then, uh, the, same, the same ideas were projected into Eastern Europe and the bloc states um, after the war, um, and wiped out, wiped out really any conception of a materialist uh, conception of nature, and any conception really of, of, defending, of defending nature. Um, this, this, the effect of this was profound in terms of Marxism in the 20th century, because after the, after the Second World War, um, Stalinism was, 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 was dominant um, with sections of the left, and, um, and the, 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 left, the left became dominated quite quickly after the war uh, by um, productivism, really. The, the idea that, um, what I was told when I first joined the far left organisation was that, that, that mankind advances in conflict with nature. And this, 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 this was the idea that was predominant um, in the left um, after, after the Second World War. Um, it meant that, it meant that, um, that, that uh, when, when the ecology, the ecology movement began, began to develop um, in the 1960s, um, it wasn't led by Marxists. Was led mainly by ecologists and scientists, um, and, um, and in, in particular, um, you know, the, the, to the American writers, um, uh, uh, Scott Scott Neary, uh, that, 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 that wrote a major work on, on the effect of happening, the, the impact on the wilderness in the United States, and of course, um, Rachel Carson, who wrote in 1962, um, Silent Square. Um, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to stress how much um, Silent Spring, the impact of Silent Spring, had on the, on, on the post-war movement in terms of the ecology. In fact, I think it would be recognised as one of the most important parts of the entire 20th century. Um, didn't mention climate change. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was about the, the impact of um, agricultural chemicals on biodiversity uh, and it was very strongly opposed by the by the um, the, the agricultural chemist the agricultural uh, chemical producers who uh, who took Carson actually to a congressional commission saying that she was damaging the agricultural industry and um, you know the famous thing is that you know she won and they actually came down in her favour and her books on two million copies and so on. And, and then a few, ten years later, you had the, the, the birth of the ecology movement, the Greenpeace, then after the Green Party, and we, we, we began to develop in that way. But Marxism at that stage, there were Marxists, very importantly, there were Marxists um, writing at that time on ecology. Um, and um, Bellamy Foster pointed to quite a few of them. But they were marginal really to the development of the movement. Um, it wasn't really until the late 80s and the, the rise of the understanding of climate change and the formulation of the, of, of the, um, the, the international movement of climate change um, that more Marxists, including Bellamy Foster, began to look at the issue and began to start voting again about the ecology of the planet. Um, so, so that's the problem with the 20th century. I'll try and cover the problem with the 21st century um, in a minute. But it's impossible to talk about really the, um, the relationship with, with human beings and nature without looking at the biodiversity crisis. The biodiversity crisis, which is known quite widely as the sixth extinction, um, the sixth great extinction. In the, in, in the history of the planet, um, uh, which um, which means that species are disappearing um, at a thousand times the rate of their natural uh, their, uh, their background rate of disappearance. Um, 
it's the biggest single, it's the biggest single aspect by far of the whole ecological crisis. I mean, if you take, for example, um, you know, I've been using Elizabeth Colbert's uh, book, The Sixth Extinction, uh, which we've got at the back, which is a very popularly written but, but very good exposition of the depth of the ecological crisis, is that um, mammals, for example, mammals, at the current time, a quarter of all man mammal species is at risk in the short to medium term. A quarter. The background rate of extinction of mammals is one every 700 years. One every 700 years. The, the, rate, of, the rate of this is, is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. Um, amphibians are the most at risk. And amphibians, and it's an astonishing figure, figures a bit hard to get the head round immediately. Amphibians are going extinct 45,000 times the background rate of extinction. 45,000 times the background rate of extinction. Um, it's a catastrophic uh, development that's taking place. And it's not, of course, just that, you know, are other species important? Um, you know, do we have to have this? Do we have to have this vision of eventually achieving socialism and we're the only ones left in the desert of some kind? Um, but the whole biosphere is a closely integrated and finely balanced um, equilibrium. And um, as one species disappears, others become, um, others become vulnerable as a result of it. If if the, if, if the pollinating insects that uh, produce you know, half of our food, like half of our food, they disappear, we have a very big problem. Um, we have a very big problem anyway, we have to say, in feeding 9 billion people. Um, it's quite possible to feed, uh, to, um, feed 9 billion people by, um, by um, agro-business and, uh, and, and technology, but to feed 9 billion people, or 10 billion people, or 11 billion people, without destroying the biosphere in the process, is another type of vision to get completely, completely uh, um, another question. So, um, so we're seeing uh, habitats destroyed at an increasing rate, point about putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is that carbon dioxide dissolves very easily into the water, therefore it goes quickly from the atmosphere into the sea, and the sea is becoming ever more acidic, and as a result of this, coral reefs, including the Great Barrier Reef at the present time, is bleaching, and the, um, and the uh, crustaceans in, in, in the sea that rely on calcium to, to produce, produce their shells are just being dissolved and, um, and some areas of sea are all be, already becoming completely dead. This is the this is, um, this, this is, this is situation that, that we're in. Um, there, is a, there is a big problem. Is that two minutes left? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, so the debate, there are big debates now in, on, on all this in, 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 in the left. Um, the, I think the most important taking place at the present time is the debate around what, around what is called the Anthropocene. Um, it's a debate which didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, it's a proposal that um, a um, major climate scientist called Crewson has made, um, and that is that the impact of human beings on the biosphere of the planet is now such that it defines the geological epoch, the geological epoch that the planet is in. Now, I didn't know before I got into these debates a year or two ago that, um, that there, is, um, there is a committee, <laughs> there is a committee of scientists that, um, that, um, that defined the Divides the four and a half billion years of, of, of the history of the planet 
into um, into uh, eons and periods and, and epochs and all this kind of thing. Um, the period we're in at the present time is called the Halicene. Um, this is basically means uh, the, the, the post ice age period. Um, it's a period, it's a period of, of, of 2,000 years since the last ice age, um, where the planet has been, has been reasonably stable. Um, and, um, and the proposal is that that is redefined, and it will be, in the next two or three years, it will be redefined um, as the Halicene, or in other words, an epoch defined by human beings. And this is the first time that an epoch has been defined um, in, in that way. Um, it, has, um, it, 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 has a, it has many implications. It is, in fact, a very big debate. Maybe if I finish on this point, it is, in fact, a very, very big debate. Um, 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 Andreas Mill, for example, who is an FR comrade in, in Sweden, is a scientist. Um, he opposes the concept of the Halicy, of, of the, uh, of, of the Anthropocene. He, he opposes it on, 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 on the basis that we should be talking not about the Halicy, or human beings, but about capitalism. Therefore, it should be, we are now in the epoch of, uh, of the impact of capitalism. Um, this, 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 in my opinion, is a very, very big mistake, and, um, and uh, you know, I, think, I think it goes to the heart, really, of many of the debates going on around ecology at the present time, because it tries to argue that the impact of human beings on the biosphere started with the, with, with the rise of capitalism um, at the end of the 17th and into the 18th century. This has to be said in the since Homo sapiens emerged from Africa 180,000 years ago, um, they quite quickly um, had an impact on, um, on every, virtually every habitat on the planet. Um, as, as they expanded because they're because they're so, they're so efficient, because they're an organisation, because they they they, 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 have, they, have, they have language and, and they, they, they have collective collective organisation, yet they, 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 were able, they were able very quickly to overcome species on the on, on globe that way. So, so this starts a, a, long, a long way before the, the advent of capitalism. It was of course much boosted by the advent of capitalism um, and, um, and you know, we've seen it boosted many times over. But it is an important point. We just can't, def we just can't <coughs> define this as capitalism. And, and Andreas Mann argues, for example, that we shouldn't talk about species because that's speciesism. We should only talk about capitalism. But this is a problem. Um, and it's a fundamental point because I think we have to talk about the, we have to talk about the impact of our species on, on the planet. This is not anti-Marxist as it sometimes is portrayed. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we don't recognise the class divisions that exist within that species, but nevertheless, the species has an impact. And every single person on the planet has an ecological footprint. Very, very vastly different sizes. So there is an issue of the species. So, uh, so that's some of the debates that are, are, are taking place around the Anthropocene. So, um, Okay. Thank you. Um, we're now going to break up into groups and people can discuss what they think is all in this table so there. Um, primarily, you have questions. Can I, can I just, can I just, uh, yes, I think so. Can I just, um, pose two possibilities in the group discussions. One is that a group can discuss the totality of what I said. Or, um, I do have a question, yes. which is, is it wrong or, or specious, or indeed anti-Marxist, to talk about the impact of modern humans on the planet as a species rather than just the impact of capitalism? 